God bless you. God bless you. My name is Maylene. God bless those that are at home live stream. God bless the church that is here today. I am going to start off by reading the word of God. And our scripture is found in Matthew 20. And we're going to start at verse 20 and we're going to continue down to verse 28. And we read this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right hand and one on the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right hand or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard James and John, he asked what James and John had asked. They were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world, they lorded over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because you are here in the midst of us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and that we will take what you have spoken to us with us and we would never forget it, that we would change. In Jesus' precious name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. So today, in our Follow Me series, we've been learning about how we're being called by the Savior. We are called to follow. And we learned that there is a cost of being a disciple. Last Sunday, the Lord used our Pastor Ray to teach us how to count the cost of being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. This sermon tonight, it's based on change. The change that must be made within our, our hearts. The things that are within us that could be blocking us from really seeing what we are giving up if we don't count the right cost. There are different kinds of change that we like to make in our lives. Easy changes like our hair, hairstyle, haircuts, um, changes in our weight, our diet, uh, changes in our wardrobe because you know the 80s are done and you want to be up with the style. Some change locations. I went from the Bronx and now I'm in New Jersey. Uh, some make changes from um, living in a condo and moving to a beautiful home. Changes like these, they're easy to make for the most part. They're not completely life-altering decisions. But there are some changes that are hard to make and can be life-altering. Emotional changes. Sometimes there are dysfunctional family issues that we carry with us. Behaviors that we have picked up on the way, walking through life, that may be some changes that you wish you can turn the hands of time, go back, and maybe reduce some things. In these situations, we find it is sometimes hard to change in our own strength. We cannot change ourselves through rules, through discipline, it's hard. We fall off the wagon. Some people are, are even insensitive to others, and they say, hey, why can't you just snap out of it? Like, get out of it. You wish you could. You really do. Because our behaviors, they come from our heart. 
I have a God who changes us through the work of Christ and the work of the Spirit within us. The work is done for us through him. You see, our circumstances and our struggles can eventually trigger a sin pattern. It can trigger a behavior within us like a coping mechanism, like a shield from the pain that we've gone through. And it gives us this false sense of security, of pleasure. It kind of muffles the, the pain for a little while. We see this sometimes with teens when they have no hope or no one to talk to or turn to. They turn, they're easily swaying to cutting themselves, pinching themselves, wanting to feel a pain to, just to get out of their heads. And these things lead to other harming habits that are difficult to remove later on in life. These sins are caused by thoughts and desires that are deeply rooted within our heart. That we eventually, we want to do away with them. When we sin, we believe a lie. Instead of trusting God, we need help. Change takes place when we start to respond to God's goodness. We respond to God's grace. And we turn to him in faith. Hopeless as we are, we turn to him. Something else that stops us from change is pride. Pride says, you got this. There's no need to turn to God for this situation. Pride says you don't need God's help. And you could do this one thing on your own. But faith says you don't need the old way because God is greater and better than anything that sin offers. Remember, sin is anything, anything. It could be mental, it could be physical, that separates you from God and his truth. Our pride makes us make excuses or hide our sin. We think that we're okay. We have everything under control. We could change on our own with positive thoughts, with doing good for others. You know, the universe, and when you do good, it comes back to, you know, karma. It, no, that's a lie. We sin when we desire or worship or treasure an idol, which is anything that takes the place of putting God first. Change takes place when we lay down whatever that is, that idol the Bible calls, or that treasure, or that habit, that we respond and we respond to God's good nature. We respond to his calling. We respond to his grace, and we turn away from the thing that is holding us back from changing. We call it repentance. And it's a constant. It's a daily act of surrendering. A daily act of turning away from that thing that has tied us up, chained us up, bound us up. The theologians call it mortification. It's just putting to death or letting God smash that thing that belongs to the sinful nature. Repentance is what we do in response to faith. It's actually, literally, believing that God is telling the truth. That he can go in our heart and sit down at the seat of our emotions and turn some stuff around. The ultimate change is when Jesus comes into the heart of a believer by us just simply asking him to. Asking him to rescue us from ourselves. What is your rescue story? I have a rescue story. I was a lost teen that Jesus rescued, even when I wasn't even looking for him. He changed me, and it wasn't overnight, but I felt his love over me, and I knew it was real. I had things in my heart that I had to surrender so I can follow him wholeheartedly. And it's a daily dying to my desires that are not of God. Taking up my cross and following him. And you know why I did it? And why I do it? Because I had to count the cost of what it means to not be his disciple. What I am giving up 
if I don't follow him. What I would be giving up is too precious. Here are some other examples in his word. King David in 1 Samuel 16. He first started off, King David first started off as a little insignificant shepherd boy. He was overlooked. He was the youngest. He was unnoticed. He was unimportant. Until one day, Samuel was called to go to Jesse's house looking for that particular person to be king. And after seeing all the big men and the stocky brothers, God said, no, that's not them. He turns to Jesse and says, don't you have someone else? None of these are it. Jesse says, well, you know, I have David. He's the little one. He's up there in the, in, in the mountains with the sheep. I'm not leaving until you get him. He was anointed to be king. Even though he was underestimated, even though he was undervalued by the people around him, God saw him. God saw his heart, a pliable, a moldable heart. God sees your heart. God sees your pain. God sees your sorrow. You might be feeling undervalued like David was. But God has come to make you a prince, a princess. He has given you an anointing and a great value to be the child of a king. The potential was there. God saw it and set David apart. And now David needed to be faithful and grow in that change. For some, the change doesn't happen overnight. God works with everyone differently because he knows us. He knows what we need. This next story is Ruth. She was an insignificant widow who left her people to follow and care for her widow mother, Naomi, her mother-in-law. I could just imagine the pain that Ruth felt when she found out that her husband just died. And that now Naomi doesn't have anyone to take care of her because her sons are dead. She's destitute. Now what? Alone with no one to take care of her. But she made a choice. She made a choice to change her location and follow the mother-in-law. She left her land. She left her gods. She left her idols to honor her mother-in-law. She sacrificed her life. And one day while she was gleaning and picking up the leftover wheat on the floor in despair, picking up scraps from the dirt, poor insignificant, Boaz looked down on her. Boaz looked at her and saw something in her. And God used Boaz as a kingsman redeemer to restore her. He married Ruth, and she was restored with a home, with a family, with wealth. She was not a prideful woman. She was humble, and Naomi didn't have to fear for anything. God changed her life. God gave her a rescue story. God sees us. He rewrites our story. What was your rescue story? He saw me. He sees you. He has a good story to write for you if you don't have one yet. Change can be scary, but you could trust him. Trust and just follow. He has deposited something great inside of those who hear his voice. It's like a seed that continues to grow that is planted. And for it to be birthed, Great pains, almost like labor pains, have to sometimes be felt. But if those labor pains don't come, that beautiful gift that the Lord has will not be birthed. Sometimes you have to just go through some stuff. I'm pretty sure the pain that Ruth felt when her husband died, it was tremendous. But that pain didn't dominate her. It didn't dominate her to press on. It didn't stop her to be exactly at the right place where the Lord wanted her to be so that her story can change. 
God rewrites our story of pain, our story of sorrow, our stories of uncertainty. It could be scary when we are uncertain, unsure, when we're used to our old self, what we are taught, what we learned to keep the walls up, to play it safe so that no one hurts you, to be hard. It's like that farmer who, when a stranger went to that farm and said, hey, I would like to buy some of your produce, but I don't see anything growing. Did you just buy this farm? Did you just start? And the farmer says, actually, I haven't planted anything. It's like, but why? Well, I was scared that the soil might not be that good. And I was afraid that the rain might not come and water the plants. So I just didn't plant anything. I was playing it safe. A farmer not planting is like God's children not trusting their father. Stop playing it safe. Doing the same thing over and over again. Pastor Ray called it last Sunday insanity. We have been called by the Savior to do good works. And it's not how we want it to be done. It's not when we think it's supposed to happen. How we're grown up to think. We have all have had different upbringings. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different things that have shaped our personality to who we are now. Some good, some awful. Some of affluence, some of poverty. And we all have had different kinds of chains. Chains that have kept us bound to our old ways in one way or another. The chains that made us slaves to our old patterns, old behaviors, those old habits, those old teachings that we fall back to. Someone once told me how they read about we need to be slaves to Jesus and we're called to be slaves to Jesus. And they were upset. And they said, I don't want to be anyone's slave. And it's obvious that they didn't comprehend the meaning of that very important scripture. In fact, we have been slaves already. We didn't know Jesus. And when we didn't know Jesus, we were slaves. We were slaves to the darkness. We were slaves to the evil desires of this world. We were slaves to our own bodily impulses and our flesh. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. We were dead in our sin, literally. Well, maybe not literally, you know, we're not zombies walking around, but the analogy is there. We didn't see that because we were blinded. Our chains had us trapped. In Christ, there is freedom. In Christ, those chains are broken. In Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are children of the Most High God, Romans 6, 6. And the Apostle Paul says, I would rather prefer because of my now freedom to dedicate it all to our Savior who has freed us. He is my God. He is my Father. He is my Lord. What does Lord mean? He's my master. He's my master. And if he's my master, I'm in good hands. Jesus knew that men are a little bit risky to trust in. Jesus knew that they're risky candidates as apostles and disciples. But if Jesus wanted to play it safe, like the farmer, he would have never chosen John or the younger son of Zebedee, John and James. John was trouble. We hear so much about Peter, but John. Mm. There are more negative characteristics of John in the New Testament than any of the 12. And yet he became the beloved apostle of love. John experienced the greatest change, in my opinion, because he went from the most proud, the most arrogant, the most intolerant and narrow-minded of the 12 to the man whose writings have done more to spread love than any other Bible. 
He wrote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is a good example of the fact that Jesus did not choose men for what they were, but for what he knows they will become. John did not bring out his mistakes. He wasn't trying to keep it real like Peter was. He would rather forget them and brush it under the rug. You know, sometimes we hide what we are. We, we dress it up. We hope nobody's going to notice. Matthew 20, 24 shows that he and the disciples were arguing as to who was the greatest, especially in the account of Luke. We see John thinks that he's the best of all, or at least second to Jesus. He had the audacity to ask Jesus for a place at his right or left hand of the kingdom. In Luke 9, 49, we see John showing how intolerant he was and impatient to people when he was seen rebuking a man that was trying to cast a demon out in Jesus' name. He forbade the man and he told him, what are you doing? You cannot do that because you're not a follower like us. As if Jesus was a possession that he can use and not the man. And he was so prejudiced. The next paragraph talks about how the Samaritans and the Jews, they disliked each other. And the, one day, the Samaritans refused to attend to Jesus and his disciples. And when they re refused him... John and his brother James got so mad, their temper blew out of proportion, and he wanted to burn the place down. And he actually tells Jesus, do you want us to pray so that heaven can consume them? This was John's solution to social injustice and prejudice of that day. Sounds fairly familiar, doesn't it? John and his brother James were called sons of thunder. Mark 3, 17. And they were no doubt spoiled rotten. Have you ever met a spoiled rotten child who then grows up to be a spoiled rotten adult? They had so much wealth, hired servants. They were the ones who actually took in Mary, the mother of Jesus at the crucifixion. Salome was their mother and she was of high stature. She once asked Jesus to give her boys, she asked Jesus to give her boys heavenly positions and high. And that's what she was used to in her day since she was a woman of wealth and a position too. So now we know where James and John get it from. In the secular world, we're used to getting places just by knowing someone. You know how it goes. You get the job based on who you know. Well, they figured it will be the same thing with Jesus. And Jesus uses this to teach them an amazing lesson. The other disciples, they heard all of this. They were mad. They were mad that they would even ask that. Maybe even a little worried too because they knew they didn't have that clout. But God isn't about that. The struggle for power is the same in any group of men, and it was the same there. Greatness and position was all they thought about. Jesus teaches them that they're acting like Gentiles. Or, or the meaning is better said, you're acting like blind people of the world that think wealth and power is everything and do anything to be on top. But Jesus flips it on them, and he says his kingdom is the absolute reverse. The greatest are the servants. What is a servant? You know what? We shouldn't mind it not one bit to refer ourselves as servants of such a good father. And he gives us a powerful example for the son of man, meaning himself, Jesus didn't come to be served like a royal king, but he came to die and give his life as a payment for the lives of many. But later, we see just how spending time with the Savior really transformed John. In the book of Acts, we see him with Peter going to the Samaritans, the same ones that he despised. And he was laying hands on them. And he was seeing how the Holy Spirit was filling them 
And John prayed down a beautiful anointing from heaven to bless them. To bless the very people that he first wanted to harm out of anger. This is what Jesus does. Jesus came to save men, not destroy men. Jesus had to rebuke John a few times. Several times for arguing about his greatness. For arguing, for forbidding a man to heal someone in Jesus' name. And for his bad temper. John had some learning to do to become the apostle of love. Jesus already knew his character. He knew his character fully. And John took the risk of trying to be all God wanted him to be. To let down his guard. To bring down those walls. To leave his comfort. What he learned from his mother. What he knew from the past. He took the risk, which really wasn't a risk at all, to follow after our Savior. We're called to do the same. What's keeping us? What's keeping us? What is capturing our attention? Or what has us bound? Do we even know? Do we even know that we are bound? Jesus exposes idols. Things that we feel we cannot give up in order to follow him completely. That thing that is capturing our heart, what is it? Don't count the wrong cost. Jesus in Luke 14, 26 tells us to count the cost of discipleship. But if we count the cost based on what we lose here on earth, we're focusing on the wrong cost. Tonight, Jesus wants us to count the cost of being a non-disciple. The cost of turning away from his call. For what profits a man to gain the whole world but yet loses his soul at the end? This is what we lose if you count the wrong cost. And I have ten things here. One, loss of being forgiven from all of our sins and accepted by our Father. Two, loss of the joy of having fellowship with our Father and Jesus, the Son who communicates with us freely. Three, the loss of the empowering presence and joy of the Holy Spirit. Four, joy, strength, comfort for being part of the body of Christ, which is the church and the everlasting fellowship of the saints in heaven. Five, having God's grace to meet our every need. Six, being part of destroying the evil works of the devil. We can be part of the ones that stop him from reaching others' lives and destroying them. Seven, loss of the joy in knowing that every precious and very good gift from the Lord and promises are for them who say yes and amen. Eight, the loss of the triumphant feeling of victory and the satisfaction of seeing others delivered from Satan and the domain of darkness and seeing ourselves saved by Satan's traps. Nine, the loss of the abundant and full life of Jesus that he would have given you if you say yes to him. And 10, the loss of eternal joy, the heavenly treasure of eternal life with God. An inheritance so great that the worst suffering here in this age is light and momentarily compared to it. You lose God. Over what? Money? Matthew 19, 22, the rich man, he chose money over God. And so he chose mind-blowing destruction and spiritual bankruptcy because of it. This is the tragedy of idolatry. He walked away from Jesus. But Zacchaeus, in Luke 19, 1, he climbed the sycamore tree. He was a tiny little one. And maybe he was afraid of heights. But that didn't stop him. And he heard Jesus and Jesus said, I'm coming to your house. 
And that's all he needed. He sold everything he had because he was a governmental thief, a tax collector. And he gave back double to those he cheated from. Which left him probably with nothing. But the cost of discipleship would have been too high to lose. If Jesus exposes an idol, something we feel we cannot give up, don't walk away like the rich man. Climb like Zacchaeus. Climb over every obstacle to get to Jesus. Don't choose the shackles of this world over everlasting glory and eternal gain. Christ is the real gain. Philippians 3.8 says, I count everything as worthless. When compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, Christ is the real and true treasure. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you tonight. What the Lord has deposited in you is about to be birthed. Let go of the weight that is holding you down. Don't count the wrong cost. And I leave you with this verse. And it says, Isaiah 43, 19, for I am about to do a new thing. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Now it springs up. It is growing inside. So count the cost. Count the right cost. God bless you. And let's just bow our heads. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this sermon series. You are calling us to follow you. And there are things that are inside of us that may be impeding us from following your steps. We take one step and sometimes we just take two back. Father, I pray that you, the searcher of the heart, would seek out that, that we cannot let go. Lord, I pray that you would reveal what it is that is hindering us, that is stopping us from running the race the way you have called us to, to fulfilling the plan and the purpose that you have set forth for our lives. For the story has already been written since before we have been born. And it is up to us to say, yes, Lord. I trust you. Even when I don't see it, I believe. Even when I don't feel it, I believe. For you are not a man that should lie. Father, help us to turn to you in every situation. Help us to act like you're saying the truth, my God. That we would believe in faith. And just hopelessly surrender to our king. Father, I delight in calling you my master. I am delighted to call myself a slave to a good father. Because I know where I came from. I know what you have taken me out of. I know how you have restored me and you have placed my feet upon a rock. Sometimes those whispers of the old call. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for all of those who are feeling that past call. To lay it at your feet. To lay it at your feet and that you would bring mortification to it. That you would make that die by your blood that we would surrender it to you 
that pain of the past, that thing that someone did to us, that unforgiveness that we continue to hold, even though we give it to you today, but tomorrow we pick it up. In Jesus' name, I ask that you bring deliverance, that your Holy Spirit would move in a way that would just consume that which is not of you. Father, I pray all these things because there is an enemy that has blinded so many. And we're so consumed with ourselves and our past and what we think and what we feel that that is the trap because we do not stop and think of others. The others that you want us to speak to. The others that you want us to shine light to. The others that you have given us a word that is shut up in our bones and we keep it to ourselves. Because we are so self-centered and we do not open our mouths. God, I pray your forgiveness. I pray, Lord God, that you would just do a mighty work. And you would continue to do a mighty work in Life Together Fellowship. That you would do a mighty work in Life Together Works. That your hand would move. That you would move us towards your path. That we would be obedient to what you have called us to do. And that we would see the fruit of our obedience, Lord God. Not for us, but to glorify your name. To glorify your name. To give you all glory and honor because it is only because of you. It is only because of you, my God. We are but your humble servants. And if we don't do it, you'll use the rocks. But Father, I ask that you use us. Send us. Use us. Father, we say amen to your call. We say amen to your call. You call us to follow, and we say amen. Because the cost of not following you is too great. The cost of not following you can have ramifications to the generations that come before us, Lord God. We ask, Lord God, that you would continue to move in each and every one of our hearts and that we would just give it all to you. We glorify your name. We bless your name. We lift your name on high, your name that is above every name that every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Your glory and honor alone. It is our delight and our privilege to serve you. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray all of these things.